You know what? How many agree with me that we serve a God that is able to meet not just those big needs in your life, because, I mean, those crisis things, you know, where we just cry out to God, and, but you know that he's, a, he's aware of all the little things that you battle every single day? Amen. And I think sometimes when we go through those difficult times in our life, when we're broken, and, and that can mean a lot of different things to something different for every single one of us. And when it's difficult and you're in a state of brokenness and you're struggling and you're battling and, and, and you get to that point where, man, you don't even sense God. And, and you're just walking in the dark. And it's difficult sometimes to find God in the dark. Because it's in that place where sometimes our faith is weak. Sometimes we're overwhelmed by the circumstances of our life. We are hearing so many other voices, uh, so many different things, and, and, and we don't seem to sense, feel, or notice God. And in, in that place, it can be so difficult to continue on. Being broken before God is, is something unique. It allows God to do something that on a normal day-to-day -day basis, he doesn't do because we're just so in control. And we don't allow God to do certain things. We, we kind of hold back and we do different things. But when God pushes us to that point where we just break before God, man, we're like, we don't even care about Just do whatever you got to do. And God never wants to bring us to that point, but so often we have to because that's when we get to that point where we just say, God, do whatever you got to do. You know, it's, no, it's so easy sometimes to notice broken things. Broken window, broken mirror, broken furniture. But I have found sometimes one thing that is difficult to notice broken, and that is you, or me. Because we are so good at putting on this smile, and saying the words, I'm great. Even though inside I'm broken. Even though inside I'm struggling. Even though inside I'm really, really going through a difficult time. But as Christians, it's a, it amazes me how good we are at this. Listen, I want you to be brutally honest this morning. Not just before me, but before God. And I want you to grab out the, your outline and follow along with me. But I want us to, because listen, you are so conditioned and so good at covering up your brokenness, your pain, your hardship, your battles, with a smile, and I'm great. You know, the words, I'm great, or you use your fingers to text somebody, I'm fine. But your heart, if it is ever able to truly speak, it would say, I'm broken. I'm hurting inside. My life is crumbling. My world is crumbling. Everything I, I know is falling apart. Everything that was normal is abnormal now. And I don't know what to do. Today I'm asking you, let's let God do what God can do. Because I assure you of this one thing. Your pain is His purpose. Your misery can be the next ministry in your life. No matter what it is you're going through, I truly want you to think that there's a God that's bigger than your pain, bigger than your problems, bigger than your misery, bigger than your relational problems and issues and struggles and all the habits, hang-ups and hurts in your life. God's bigger than all of those things. And so today, I believe if we do our part, and God does His part, we're going to see something special. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You, Lord, for Your Word. Thank You for Your truth. Thank You for Your presence in this place. Thank You, Lord, that no matter how bad life gets, it's never 
out of your reach. It's never gone too far. You can always, Lord, do a miracle. And Lord, I pray a special prayer over those that are here this morning. That Lord, they, they're going through the motions. They believe, but they just almost can't even be seen. And they're none. Those marriages that are struggling, Lord, those relationships, those that are battling physical problems, financial problems, Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you would give us peace and that you would intervene in each and every one of our lives today. And that you take the broken pieces and create something beautiful. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. The principle of spiritual brokenness, because this is where ultimately God wants to take you, is the process where God uses all these issues in our life to push us to the end of ourselves. To where we get to that point where God wants to lead you out of something and into something new. Out of the dark and into His marvelous light. Because sometimes when we battle, sometimes when we struggle, and sometimes when we go through extreme difficulty in our life, it is just dark every day. Oh, you still believe. But you just like, I'm cursed. God's mad at me. God doesn't hear my prayers. God's nowhere to be found. Let me just tell you something. This is the beauty of God. When we truly go before Him with our brokenness, with our problems, and give them to Him, He answers it. Incredible ability to take the pieces and to put them together. And when his light shines through it, it's beautiful. When the light of Christ shines through your brokenness, it's beautiful. Think of it. That's why those stained glass windows are so popular and so powerful at the same time. When you, have you ever seen the stained glass uh, windows? Our church doesn't have them. I wish they did because it's just an incredible symbol of what God can do. It's like these pieces of glass, different colors put together. And then when the light shines through it, it's beautiful. And like that, it's like in your life, God can take the pieces. And when the uh, light of Christ shines through those things, it is a beautiful masterpiece. Even though it's broken and you still have lines and you still see the pieces. And it's not like it once was. Let me just tell you a little truth right here. Before you were broken, things were good. Amen? But now that I'm broken, and even though God's put the pieces together, what is beautiful about that is He shines through that. Everything about Him, His fingerprints are on your life. Everything about God's grace and mercy and forgiveness shines through the pieces of your life. You kind of think about it like that. You're like, wow, I think I'm a little better off now. Even though it's not exactly the way it was, but when Christ is the center of your brokenness, it can be better than it was before. Even though you still have the cracks in the lines. But there's something special about when we enable God to shine through our lives, regardless of what it is, regardless of how great we are. Because sometimes, here's the, here's the powerful part of this. When we're in that state of brokenness, where God has brought us to that place of humility and total surrenderance, we are, even though we're broken, are in a better place because now God shines. God has all the pieces in His hands. Because we have a tendency, when we have got it all together and everything is good and whole, we're in charge. God doesn't want you to be in charge. And so a broken life with God in charge is far greater than our whole life without God in charge. Get it? Got it. Okay, now listen. I want you to understand that God places a premium on broken things on you. Follow me. God places a premium on broken things you. Man, on the other hand, we tend to discard broken things. If it's broken, we trash it. If it's falling apart, we trash it. If it doesn't seem to work like it once did and it's not good, we trash it. We throw it away. God, on the other hand, like a mother hen, gathers it. He says, I'm going to do something special with this. 
Because now, this person in this broken state is going to allow me to shine through their life and I'm going to do greater works through them in their broken state than I ever could do in their whole. And that's the goal of God. Listen, church, if you're here this morning and you're battling some things, this word is for you. This message is for you. God is wanting you. It is not a coincidence that you're here this morning. I never believe that. And I always believe and I always tell you this. When God shows up, He never, ever wants to be a spectator. Never. God's at work. God's at work right now in your heart. God's at work in this place. We just have to let Him do it. We have to. Listen, church. Broken things can be great in the hands of God. You can be great in the hands of God. Look. God uses broken things. Listen to this. It takes broken soil to produce a crop. Broken clouds to give rain. Broken grain to give bread. It was broken bread that fed 5,000. It's the broken alabaster jar that anointed Jesus. It was the broken body of Jesus that has given us all salvation. That is what God can do. He takes that which is broken. Listen, you say, well, you know what? I'm in this place, Pastor Ken, and I just don't know where God is. You know where he's at? He's right next to you. Look, I love this scripture here. Psalm 34, 18. Let's all read this together out loud. Would you help me out with this? The Lord is close to the broken heart. He rescues those whose spirits are... Ooh, ooh, that sounds harsh. Crushed. God's right next to you. God draws near to the broken heart. He feels your pain. He knows your pain. Look, I think about Peter and me, to me personally was more broken than Peter. Peter was the rock, right? Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Listen, for all of you Catholics that feel like Peter was the church and the first pope, look, when Jesus, I believe when Jesus said, hey, upon this rock, I will build this church, my church. He was talking to Peter, but he was speaking about the revelation of Peter. Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus is upon that rock of revelation. I'll build my church. Because if a church believes that I'm the Savior, that I am the Son of God, then we can build this thing. And, and the kingdom of God will advance. Look, but Peter was, was, was definitely a pillar in the church and used greatly by God. Until the fourth ever. Everybody else is going to run, Jesus, but you know what? I have your back. These other disciples are going to flake on you, but I will be there. As soon as the opportunity presented itself, Jesus, be, I mean, Peter began to deny Christ. Deny, deny, deny three times. I don't even know the man. And that scripture says in the one time when he's the last one, I don't even know him. He was calling down curses from heaven. Jesus walked up and looked at him. I don't think he was mad at Peter. I don't think it was anger and disgust. I think this is this incredible expression of love. And the Bible says that Peter ran and weeped bitterly. He was broken. He was crushed. How could I do that to my Savior? Think about that. He was in a bad place after that. He was ruined. And then, after the resurrection, and even though Jesus appeared to them and, and they, they go through all these uh, different in encounters, Peter still wasn't right. And you know what? This is what happens. Here's another truth. I don't like to just give you the... the God's Word is great to inform you, give you a lot of uh, information, but I believe the most important thing is to get the truth within the information. Amen? Get this. Peter was doing exactly what many of us do. We're broken. We've disappointed God. I'm sick of this. I never get it right. I never do it right. I never can live this Christian life the way I should. I'm just so fed up with it all. I'm just forget it. What does Peter do? He says to his brothers... The, the other disciples, you know what? Forget it. I'm going fishing. And he goes back to what he used to do. How many times have we seen people get delivered and God just do this incredible thing and, and then all of a sudden they go back to the old way of life. They go back to the things they used to do. Peter gets back in the boat and he says, I'm going fishing. I know that. I just know God being already let him down. I, I don't even know how to do this. I'm not even sure. But I do know how to fish and so we default sometimes and go right back to what we used to do. 
All night they fish, they didn't catch anything. Jesus was on the shore. Jesus sees them out there and says, hey, throw your nets out. Hey, we've been out all night. We haven't caught anything. But, all right. And this huge. And then the disciples said, that's the master. That's the teacher. It's Jesus. And Peter gets out and runs to him. They share a meal together. And then after that, Jesus approaches Peter. Jesus knew he still wasn't right. He said, Peter, do you love me? What are you doing? Do you love me more than these? And, 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 and when he said that, a lot of scholars and commentators that we're not sure exactly, maybe Jesus said, do you love me more than these disciples love me? The other ones that didn't deny me? Do you love me more than they love me? Do you love me more than these things? Maybe the boat, the nets, the fishing, your old way of life. Do you love me more than that? Because why are you going back to that? And so they have this encounter. And three times Jesus has to do you love me? And through that process, he reinstates Peter. Peter gets back on track. Because Jesus says, look, the life that you're about to live is going to be tough. You're going to go through some difficult times and the love is a little shaky. You're going to bail out on me every time. And I love that picture because we mess up my people. And the truth is, you need to understand this, no matter how bad you've messed up, no matter how dark your days are, no matter how broken you are, you need to know something. God loves you. And he wants, like with Peter, to meet you right at your point of need and say, do you love me? Because I love you. And I want to pull you out of that. Think about that. You know, what about Elijah? Not Elijah, but Elijah. You know who he is, right? As the, the, the great contest against the prophets of Baal, what a man of God, what a pillar of faith. Until Jezebel opens her mouth and says, uh, and sends word to Elijah, just as he has done to my, the prophets, shall be done to him. And Elijah, the mighty Elijah, that just wiped out hundreds of prophets of Baal, called down fire from heaven, has this incredible mountaintop experience, is now running for his life. What? How does that happen? Look, another truth. When you're on the mountaintop victory, you need to know something. Unless you freeze in time and never move from that spot, it's downhill from there. As soon as you leave the mountaintop, you're heading to the valley. There's always a valley after every mountaintop. There's always a valley. There's always a struggle. Every time you have a victory, the enemy's going to say, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to meet you over here, and you better be ready. Every single time. No, you can't live your life on a mountaintop because you've got to go through the valleys and the mountains, the valleys and the mountains, the hard times, the good times, the hard times, the good times, the light and the dark, the light and the dark. You need to know that you've got to stay stable in the faith not in your circumstances. Think about this. Because some of you are hurting. I can see it on your faces right now. You need to know that you might be in that valley right now. But there's some, <coughs> some truth about the valley. Because when you're in the valley, guess what? You're, you're next to, you're, now you're on, you're on the incline. You're heading back to the middle mountain. It's a struggle. It's a climb. It's difficult. But God's about to do something great in your life again. But he wants to destroy you. Now, get this. Elijah has this incredible victory. And now, look, we all have our fears. We all, the devil knows how to push our buttons. We all have something. We can be victorious and full of faith in this area of our life. But then in this area of our life, we crumble as if we have no faith at all. Look, Elijah heard that uh, Jezebel was going to destroy him. He, he believed it. This is in the natural realm now. He believed in her resources and, and the things that she has uh, uh, to be able to capture him and destroy him. He runs for his life. Now listen to this here. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, it says this. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed. Now listen to this. Listen to this. The mighty Elijah was broken. He prayed that, he said, and he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Look at this. He says, it's enough. He prayed that he might die. 
He says, I can't take this anymore. Take my life, God. I'm ruined. I'm done. It's over. Now think about this. God, you know the story, and he, he feeds him, and he sleeps him, and he feeds him, and he gets his rest, and he goes further, uh, takes a journey, and goes into this cave. Now let's jump to uh, verses 11 and 13. It says this. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah, what are you doing? I'm your God. Do you not remember the victories we just shared together? What are you doing in this place of brokenness and despair? And I think this morning, God might be saying that to you. What are you doing here? What are you doing in that place? Why are you staying there? I'm not done with you. Because when we get in that broken state, the devil wants to come in and say, you're done. God can't use you. Can't use you with your past. God is never going to use you with that sin. God is never going to use you with that mistake in your life. And all these issues. Why don't you just sit back and just put it in cruise control and just go through the motions because God's done with you. Church, that's a lie. That is a lie. The same thing I believe he did with Peter. He got him aside and said, Peter, what are you doing here? And this, do you love me? And this morning God is saying, look, think about this. I think that's an interesting scripture because we want, when we pray, we want the miraculous, don't we? We want, we want the mighty wind. We want the earth, but we want the fire. We want to see it. We want to feel it. We want to sense it. We want God to move in a mighty way in the physical realm. But God wasn't in any of that. He was in this little small voice that would be still and quiet. Or he might just be able to speak in such a way that if you're still enough, you might hear. What are you doing here? Do you still love me? Because I have big plans for you. Now, think about this. We want, ex- we want all of us, at some point, want the external power of God. But we don't want the internal revelation of God. I want the external power of God. That's good enough for me. To shake my world up, God, I need to do some things. I need to fire come down. I need to destroy my enemies. Whatever you got to do, do it. I, I like that. I can get my hands around it. I can get my head around it. I see that. I feel that. I know it happened. But this internal revelation stuff, where I've got to try to hear from you, nah, I don't know if that's going to work. Look, that's where God's going to break you. Let me just tell you something. When you're broken, you start hearing it. When he takes you to the end of yourself, because let's face it, your biggest problem is you. Your biggest problem is you. Your biggest opponent, every single time you get out of bed, is not the Satan or the world around you, it's you. Fall into everything around you. You. We've got to get out of the way sometimes, and that never happens until God takes us to that breaking point. Now, I want to show you something in Scripture. Real quick here. God does give us those external victories, but he also gives us those internal victories. And I want to show you that. I'm going to show you two great people in the Bible that are an exact problem. And we'll see two different results. Acts chapter 12, verse 9. See, now, the external victory, you need to write that down in outline. This is where your circumstances change. God moved. God did things. He did the miracle, whatever. You see the healing. You see the restoration. God answers the prayer. You got the job. You got the raise. You got the promotion. This is where we see God move and God change things. And God answer our prayer. God do great things. Let's take a look at this. Let's go back to Peter now. 
advancing the kingdom of God, one of the pillars of the church. He says, but while Peter was in prison, the church prayed, say the church prayed, the church prayed. very earnestly for him. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Now, have you ever been in a situation like this where it just, whatever, it's impossible. You're stuck. Nothing's going to change. Suddenly, well, wait a minute. There was a bright light in the cell, and the angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side and wakened him and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, get dressed, put on your sandals, and he did. Now, put on your coat and follow me, the angels ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. Now, on your outline, on that passage of scripture, I want you to circle something. On the top of that passage, I want you to circle, Peter was in prison. Peter was in prison. Now, at the bottom of that same passage, I also want you to circle, Peter left the cell. See, we love this. He was in prison, he left the cell. Those are the, the external miracles of God. Those are the kind we like. That's what we want. Peter's victory was external. His chains fell off. He walked out of the cell. He was free. Now, he went from what? Trouble to triumph. That's the miracle we all are common with, we want, we pray for, we desire. Now, I want you to write it out like this, because what did that? How did Peter find victory? The church prayed. Church, that's why we come to the altar. We believe in prayer. We believe God still answers prayer. We believe in the power of God. We believe that God still answers prayer today and does miracles if we pursue Him. In Acts 12, 5, it said this, But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for Him. Wow! Let us learn. Never, ever give up on prayer. Let us draw from that. But maybe physically impossible is always spiritually possible. And so what is bigger than you is never bigger than God. Get it? Mm-hmm. Now look at Philippians 4, 6. Look at this. Don't worry. Now I want you to circle don't worry because let me just give you the Greek for that. Stop talking to yourself. Because isn't that what you do when you're, you're worrying? Man, how am I going to fix this? How am I going to do this? What am I going to do? Who should I call? What, what, what can I do to change this situation? I, 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 and it's, you know, you're just talking to yourself. That's what worrying is. Stop talking to yourself. <clears throat> okay, it says don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Thank Him for all He has done. Look, whatever's important to you, you need to know this. It's important to God. He's involved. Prayer can turn darkness into light. Now, 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 get this. Peter was in a situation that was impossible, physically speaking. He was chained between two guards in chains, locked behind a prison cell, and guards in front of that. Impossible. The point is, no matter how you feel right now in your life, and your brokenness, and your struggles, and your hardship, no matter what it is, let this be a reminder to you if you feel like you're in an impossible situation. You're a prime candidate for a miracle. Believe that God can do whatever it is you need Him to do, regardless of the situation. So, we have the external victory, but now let's take a look at the internal. This one we don't get as well. Because sometimes victories are internal. Meaning, in a nutshell, well, my circumstances haven't changed. Things are still a mess. But I've changed. God's changing me in the midst of the turmoil and the problem. God's changing me. The second one is internal victory. Now, in Philippians chapter 1, Paul is in prison. Let's take a look at this. Chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me has been or has helped to spread the good news for everyone, including the whole 
palace guard knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here gain confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Now think about this. Paul would like to miracle Peter God. Paul would let the doors open. Paul would probably like to walk right out. But instead, the light came on within him. The light came on in Peter's cell when the angel appeared. In this situation, the light came on within, within Paul. And he had that awe oh, moment like, whoa, that's what God's doing. Hey guys, I want you to know. I love this. It says, I want you to know, the very first thing, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything, it just, it just dawned on me. I, I, I get it now. Everything that is happening to me is for the advancement of the kingdom of God. It's, it's helping spread the good news. As a matter of fact, the whole Roman guard, prison guard, palace guards, they all know that I'm changed because of Christ. And not only that, because of my commitment, because of my sacrifice, because of my determination, it has emboldened the believers and they're proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God is advancing. Man, this is a good thing. <laughs> Can you see the good in your bad? Hey, you see what I mean? It's, it's like, yeah, Paul is still behind bars and, and his life kind of seems like a mess. And, but the light of Christ is shining through. Like the stained glass window. It, 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 it's at that, that point where you're like, man, it, it can't, I just want things to get worse. Because when things get really, really bad, it seems like God does really, really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. We never pray that way. We're never, like, never going to be like, man, God, this is tough. But man, I see what you're doing. Make it harder on me. <laughs> really, really make it hard and difficult. Man, just destroy my life, God, because it seems like the harder it gets for me, the greater the work you're doing. Can you ever have a heart like that? Think about it. Well, when you get to that point where you're just like, it's not about me, it's about God. It's not my life, but His life. No longer I live, but He lives through me. That, that's the transformation that God is trying to do in our lives each and every day. That revelation was Paul's victory. Because at that moment, small picture became big picture. Now I see what God's doing. This is awesome. And so he gives it all to God. And he gives all the glory to God. You know, let me just ask you, church. Does blessing always have to be something tangible? Does it always have to be money? Does it always have to be a gift? Does it always have to be the job, the, the promotion, the, 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 you know, all those kind of things? Is that, or could it be something that he does in you? Even though everything around you is still spinning and out of control. But man, the thing he's doing inside of me is the greatest blessing of all. That's what we need to get in our daily walk. And, and it's amazing how you will be able to accept a lot of stuff that's happening when you see God in walk. Look, I don't like to stand here's the benefit. I may have pain on the outside, but on the inside. There's the God, if you give it all to God, He'll find purpose for your pain. He's going to find ministry for your misery, no matter what it is, no matter what it is, bad on this trouble. In other words, my circumstances have to change, but I have. You know, I think that sometimes we underestimate those dry seasons in our life. Things just this is when God's going. I think about David. And I want to read something to you that actually my daughter showed me, gave me. And I thought, you know what, this is so cool because, man, there's just those times when you're in those places where it seems like the most, or the least productive times of your life that God's preparing you for the greatest moments of your life. And it was so in the life of David. And again, it shows that God these broken things. Look, if your life is broken, you're a prime candidate for God to use you to do something great. Because God uses broken things. Amen? The best part of David's life comes before the great battles he ever won. And we think of David, we're thinking King David, we're thinking Goliath. We're thinking all the battles and wars that he ever won. We don't think about David in the field. 
The best part of David's story comes far before the great battles he won. It comes even before he killed the giant Goliath. The best part of David's story is the field. David wasn't looking to be king. He was looking after the sheep. When the Lord sent Samuel to anoint the next king, David wasn't even invited inside. He was, over, he was overlooked, yes. But he was committed to the present. He was doing his job. He was focused on maximizing what is in front of him, even if it looked small. Even if it was just looking after some sheep in the field. He wasn't trying to pull strings to get where he wanted to be. He knew that God could orchestrate so much better than he could ever manipulate. I want to stop right here and say, don't be discouraged in the field. If you can serve him when no one is looking, he will give you favor when everyone is. Where you are is important. You might feel hidden. You might feel alone. You might feel like you aren't valued. But don't let this time ruin your faith. Let it fill you. James 1, verse 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let this season in the field of being hidden be pure joy. It's where God molds His biggest plans. It's where God plants the deepest roots. The story didn't stop when Samuel called David from the field, though. Samuel anointed him king. And I think many of us like to fast forward to what happened next. He went back to the field. Many of us believe we have heard from God. We've heard from God like David. And know something big is in store. But we don't want to go back to the field. We hate the field. No God. Not back to the field. That's exactly where he sent David. Sometimes God is doing, is going to promise you something, but you're going to have to go right back to the field. That cruddy job, that unfulfilling thing, that lonely situation. But it doesn't mean God's promise has been broken. It just means you have a job to do a little while longer. Eventually you'll get the call to leave the field. But that might not be it either. What? When David finally left the field, it probably felt pretty good, but his trials only got bigger. Now, he had to deal with Saul. You might be just around the corner from what God's promised to you. If your problems seem to get bigger, there's a very real enemy, and you better believe he's going to do everything he can to stop you before you get to where God calls you. Many times, this is where I believe many Christians stop. We hear from God. We push through some trials. We push through some garbage. And we think that's it. Everything should fall into place right now. We leave the field. And we think, here it is. And then Saul comes into your life. And you quit. We let Saul break us. We let Saul rob us of the promise. We let Saul rob us from, of our joy. We let Saul keep us from the full plan. We've got to stop letting us all in. When you, you went through too much in the field to stop now, as a matter of fact, stop despising Saul. You need Saul. You need your endurance to be stretched for what God's about to do through you. You need those people to talk about you so that when many more people talk about you, they won't even face you. You need the bank account to hit zero so you can learn to trust God fully. You need to be treated bad by people above you so when it's your turn to leave, it will be different. Stop hating Saul because Saul makes you David. Stop running from hard things and just let God do his thing. Without the field, you probably won't be able to handle Goliath. Without Goliath, you definitely won't be able to handle many years of Saul. And without Saul, you wouldn't be prepared to be king. Whatever part of the story you're in, don't lose hope. We serve a God who knows exactly what he's doing. When Samuel anointed someone, uh, uh, Samuel anointed someone who looked like a king, God chose to run. God chose David. God chose you. He chose you to feel. You know, as the worship team comes up, 
sometimes the most difficult place to be is in the field. Because God's stretching you. He's molding you. He's preparing you. It's lonely. You, you, you feel isolated. You feel like nobody can. You feel devalued. You feel like you don't even matter. You matter. And, 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 and this morning I challenge you to give God all the broken pieces. And, 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 and maybe you're at that place right now where you feel like quitting. I feel like God can't use you. I feel useless sitting here in the field with nobody to talk to, nobody around me, nobody understands, nobody sees what I'm going through. God does. And I assure you this, God's with you in the field. He's with you right now in that struggling marriage, in that financial crisis, in that physical state that you might be in, whatever the battle is, whatever, wherever you are. Let God be God. Get it? God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your incredible love. Thank you for meeting each and every one of us right where we're at. Lord, sometimes we get ahead of you. Sometimes, Lord, we have such a difficult time hearing you. Give us ears to hear. Because, Lord, more than anything, we Lord, though you can do anything, any way you want to, but Lord, you also want to include us in your plans. It's always been your way to use man, to reach man, to make a difference, to change lives. And every one of us in this room are instruments that you're sharpening and you're preparing to use for your greater good. Help us, Lord, to quit focusing so much on our world and focus more on your kingdom. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if I can just put private moment with you this morning. If you're here this morning and you're not right with God, you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And that's where it all starts in you. Or maybe it was when you were a little child in Sunday school. Now you're an adult. Between then and now, life's happening. You've drifted and you're not right with God. You're not walking. You're not serving the Lord. But for whatever, whatever reason you're here today, God wants you to leave this place right with Him. God wants to change you, to help you, to provide salvation. But more than that, He even wants to be involved in every detail of your life. Here. And so this morning, real quick, and don't be looking around. If, if you need Christ and you want to leave this place knowing that you're right with God, and God forbid or something were to happen, and you were to pass from this life, you know that you're stuck into eternity. You can make that certain. And so if you're here this morning and don't be looking, I just want you to slip your hand up. Say, I need Christ. Thank you. Let's see your hand. I want to I say, thank you. I want to accept Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I want to surrender my life to a God that can take any life, no matter how difficult it is and how broken it is, and use it for His glory. What an amazing God. I need that in my life. Anybody else? Hey, church, I want to lead you in a prayer. Repeat after me. And maybe you felt uncomfortable in raising your hand, not sure what was going to happen. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward. Uh, but you know you need to make things right. I want you to say this prayer as well with a sincere heart and let God come into your life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me so much that you are willing to give your son. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for laying down your life so that I would have life. Life everlasting. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be Lord of my life. And every area of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Now, church, I want.
want you to repeat, all of you repeat this. Dear Lord, Dear Lord I, give you I give you my life. My life. The, good, the good, the bad, the, bad. the ugly, yeah. my brokenness. brokenness. I give it all to you. And I ask that you would shine through every broken piece, through every nook and cranny, not for my sake, but for the sake of your kingdom. Use me. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen.